Congratulations and engagement. Um, it is a delight to see so many people out today. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I think half of us are here for the topic and half of us are here for just Ivan, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> um, it's a delight to have him here. Uh, this is a Separated at Birth Reflections on Agriculture in Iceland and Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, Yaffle Connect session. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, the emergency exits are just behind you. There's a couple. Uh, also, there's um, out through the atrium, through the main uh, main entrance. Washrooms are just down this hallway. You kind of follow the hallway all the way down. There's also a water filling station if there's no water over by the coffee. And there's coffee and tea over um, on this side of the stairs. You can turn off your cell phone, put them on silent. We're webcasting today's session as per usual. Uh, we'll also probably be taking some photographs. If that's uh, an issue for you, let me know. And uh, I'll make sure that we uh, don't use any with your face. <laughs> um, I also wanted to let you know about parking. So parking for this session is complimentary. Um, if you registered for the session and entered your parking uh, entered your license plate number online, then uh, if you didn't register or didn't enter your license plate number, you can uh, pop over and see Mandy or Connie. We'll take note of it and send it up to the office so that you don't get a ticket. Uh, Jerry's pretty friendly though, so that's always helpful. <laughs> um, so before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we are gathered as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatuhivut and the Innu of Natan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. And now I need to flip my page. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. Uh, the format for today's session, we have about a half an hour uh, for Dr. Ivan Emke. Uh, and then uh, 25 or 30 minute questions, discussion afterwards. I'm sure there'll be no shortage of that. Folks watching online, variety of people, including many food producers. He spends his time these days working on several radio shows, including Fit to Eat, a show about food and farming in Newfoundland and Labrador, and a new one, The Urban Harvest, or, or on, ab on urban agriculture. He also serves on boards, and he spends some time playing obscure to some music in various sessions and bands. I'm sure it's not that obscure. <laughs> um, so I would also, before I forget about it, because I'm holding it in my hand, um, we were given a few copies of this back edition of the Newfoundland Quarterly to distribute today. They're free. Uh, they're wonderful. Uh, this one happens to be on um, Iceland. So it's a neat, uh, neat topic for today, and you can grab a copy if you're uh, interested on your way out, or you cool. can pop cool. over now before they're all gone. <laughs> all right, and so with that, I'll hand it over to Ivan. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always nice to be here in our satellite campus, see how things are going. Um, you seem to be doing fairly well for yourself here in St. John's. Uh, I'm glad to, to see that. I was, a f I was hoping that, Kathy, that you would, you would read this out, like the whole title, not oh. just not us the English. So <laughs> that way I could figure out how exactly to pronounce that. Icelandic. Anyway. As we go through, but uh, I want to tell you a story about agriculture in Iceland and agriculture in Newfoundland and Labrador, and I find the two somewhat similar, although we have very different sort of historic backgrounds, uh, but we can kind of learn from each other. But to start out, just to show some of the similarities there, uh, which one is from Iceland, which one's from Newfoundland and Labrador, left and right? What would you guess? Newfoundland's on the left. There is a clue here. Uh, the fence is straight. <laughs> so that's Iceland on the right. <laughs> How about this? Newfoundland and Labrador or Iceland? Which is which? Uh, it's on the left. Newfoundland's on the left, sorry. Yeah. No fences. There was really no clues there. There was a church in each one, but you couldn't tell one was Lutheran and one was Anglican. Um, how about this? Iceland or Newfoundland, Labrador? Can't quite see the 
animal there on the on the right, but uh, it's a goat. Yep. So Newfoundland's on the left. That's uh, outside of Trout River. There's a lovely, it's a wonderful hiking trail just to, to the right as you go up there. One more here. Uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, or Iceland? There's a bit of a clue here for the geologists, I suppose. Any guesses? Iceland on the right. Iceland on the right. A reason for why you said that? The ocean right up to the Very similar. A uh, lot of activity that takes place in the capital city. Both have second cities that are sort of the same size. So Accurary is uh, slightly smaller than Cornerbrook, and they remind uh, Accurary reminds me of Cornerbrook constantly. And I really wish that they would do more uh, collaboration. Uh, they have a, a, a ski hill seven minutes from downtown in both cities, pretty much. They uh, also have lots of tourism. It was an agricultural area, and so on. So. Who do you think were the first farmers in Newfoundland and Labrador? First European farmers. Mm. No, it was the Vikings. The Vikings were farmers. Whenever they traveled, they usually traveled with animals. Now, we don't have evidence in Lanza Meadows that they had animals there, but they brought, they, you know, they took them with them and so on. It would be very unlikely to go on a long sea voyage without animals, without agriculture, because they were farmers. And so I think, and the sagas, by the way, tell us that they did take cattle with them, if you can believe the sagas, which you can, honestly. So I've been, I've been told that that's, that's true. There is also a record that they traded skins with the indigenous people for dairy products. The first sign of sort of a dairy industry here in, in, uh, in the province. But so I don't think that was uh, two-year-old yogurt or something like that, although they eat that sort of thing there too. But it's kind of interesting to think about how, if things had been different, we'd all be speaking Icelandic. Well, maybe not, things might have changed. But, but there is a connection. And so when I, uh, I remember when uh, we did an agreement with the University of Accurary and the, the rector signed it and they were talking in Icelandic and he said, this is the language the first European language heard on your soil. Like it was very much about how this was completing the cycle between, uh, between the two places. So what I'm gonna talk about today is, um, is some of the, the farms. I want, if you've been to Iceland, you know that the, it has a real grandeur. I love how the farms tend to be uh, these little, little, I don't know if this little thing works or not, but it works here, but it doesn't work on there. Anyway, <laughs> they, they are beneath mountains and they all have waterfalls. They have uh, very modern barns. Uh, they, up until the, 70, or the 1800s or so, 19th century, the majority of Icelanders were considered farmers, 70 to 80 percent. In the middle part, well, 1935 or so, it went down. Now about 5 percent, 4 or 5 percent of the population consider themselves farmers, but many have much stronger links to, to agriculture. And the theme that I'll keep coming back to is that they have a thousand years on us because they, they believe that farming is an economic sector. Can you imagine that? Here, it's very hard to convince people that it's an economic sector that will, will be the thing that keeps rural Newfoundland and Labrador alive. But anyway, they already kind of understand that. Uh, lots of greenhouses, of course. Yes, they have that thing called geothermal. Um, but, you know, they... Um, they heat their houses with it, but that's, some of those are relatively recent when they actually hooked those all up. They, they burned all their firewood first, and then they, they started <laughs> realizing, oh, this water is like 90 degrees Celsius, and it's just coming out of the ground. Um, again, more farms. Just to make you, uh, I, 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 get, uh, I get a small commission from the Icelandic government for every tourist that goes there, so this is why I'm showing you these pictures. They have modern uh, machinery, and I don't know if I have time. I went to a farm show in Reykjavik once, and it was amazing. It was great. And the one thing that amazed me, two things, well, it might be three, but uh, anyway, uh, the fact that there was a wide diversity of people there, which with some big operators, but a lot of really small operators, and there were a lot of just people who had nothing, uh, knew nothing about farms who were there. Uh, studies show that the majority of Canadians would like to know more about farms, but they know little or nothing and there's not much opportunity. So the other thing that amazed me is that their machinery all has price stickers on it. If you go to a farm show here in Canada or United States, there's no price stickers on anything and nobody will tell you until you actually you know, almost sign a contract how much you're actually paying. Anyway, that's part of their being very forthright. 
Some of the comparisons, so they have 357,000, we have 528, I don't know, that's sort of somewhere around there, people say 530. They have a higher income per year than, uh, than we do. They pay more in taxes, but that's not an issue. Most countries that have high taxation rates are very happy. Uh, so that's a whole other question that we should deal with. Agriculture is worth 695 million. It's worth uh, about a quarter of that here. It's maybe 165, 170. It's, it's really hard to get figures sometimes on the, the, the value of agriculture here. The majority of that is supply managed commodities. So it'd be dairy, chicken, and eggs. Uh, fisheries is 3.6 billion in Iceland, 1.3 in uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. Tourism is the big thing lately, as you well know probably over six billion dollars. And we have about 1.1 billion, maybe it's one point, you know, it's something like that in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Again, it's hard to get the figures because people are applying multiplier effects to the money that actual people actually spend. So uh, it's hard to get the value. But you can see that in all those cases, agriculture is smaller than the fisheries. Even though in Iceland, the fisheries is a more relatively, it's more recent than agriculture, but it's very high value that what they're selling would be, they'd be out in the water, they would catch some cod, they would talk to the uh, restaurant in Copenhagen who is going to get that cod later in the day. I mean, it's all very uh, well organized and so on. Another comparison though is around land. So most of the land is, I don't like that term unproductive, but that's the term that we were given. In, in Iceland, likewise in Newfoundland and Labrador, we have only about 20,000 acres of cropland, about 80% of it is in hay. Iceland has a lot of hay as well. The big difference is that in Iceland there are significant subsidies, especially in animal products and animals. There's really not subsidies for crop growers, but for animal growers. So if you have sheep, sheep is historically their animal, you would get a subsidy if you've, uh, uh, for the sheep, if you've got sheep quota. It's very complicated. But about 25% of the income on the figures that I've seen for farms comes from subsidy of some sort. Uh, so we also have subsidies for our farmers. Supply management is a subsidy in, in, in a way. Uh, we also get money from various levels of government in, in farming, but I've never been able to figure out what percentage we get versus they're pretty upfront, uh, upfront about that. Just to show you that I actually do research for these occasional things and I get numbers. Uh, it shows you that the, the number of uh, hectares under production, and some of these are fairly similar to what, we don't have a lot of hectares under production of vegetables either in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, it's growing or it's, it's possibly growing, yes. This is it even more stark because the sheep are grazed and many of the cattle and horses are grazed. And so the majority of the land we call agricultural land is really rough grazing land or meadow land uh, or pastures of one sort or another. And the other is just, just because there's so much uh, dealing. With. The other thing that we have in common is that we have strong self-provisioning traditions, strong hunting traditions. And uh, so in Iceland, these are th some examples of rain reindeer on the east part of the, of the country it was brought in as well for protein, much like the moose were brought in to Newfoundland 100 years ago or whatever. Uh, ptarmigan, they eat, although there's less and less of it, and puffin, although there's less and less of that as well. Has anybody had puffin or ptarmigan when they were there? Yeah. What did you think of? Yeah, it was, it was decent, yeah. This is uh, just to show you how serious they are about collecting data. This is from uh, 2016. These are the hunting of birds in Iceland, seabirds. And these are all the species that they, they take. Um, can you imagine driving in a government vehicle to a rural community in Newfoundland and Labrador asking how many seabirds they took? I mean, I don't know, I wouldn't want to have that job. Um, so there's a different relationship between the people and the government too in terms of, uh, now not everybody maybe is, is honest about this, but they have really good data on that. And uh, that's something that we, um, that we lack. Here's, here's a couple of things that, uh, this is actually from a number of Icelandic agricultural people. So what are, what are, some, of the, what are some of the characteristics of agriculture here? And uh, so they said, well, we're a small population next to large regions with huge economies. So they're on the cusp of Europe. They're not a member of the EU, 
Uh, they're a member of the European Economic Zone or whatever, so they have to follow almost all of the regulations of being in the EU, but they're not actually bound by it. They probably won't join the EU, as it was explained to me. They'd say, well, Ivan, you know, if we join the EU, we have to follow all of their regulations and they won't follow any of ours. And it's a sort of a typical kind of uh, independent view that uh, I have good regulations too, I don't, you, should pay, you should follow mine too. And they're very proud of their animal welfare regulations and so on. Agriculture is vulnerable in Iceland and it's, they say, non-competitive in the sense that the cost of local agriculture, local food, is higher than the cost of shipping in from Spain or Portugal some of the food. So they have that same issue, although the, 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 the feeling of many people is that they would prefer to buy Icelandic. And so when they see that I have made, you know, grown in Iceland sticker, they will buy that even if the price is higher. Because, you know, they've realized that nobody else is going to feed them. Sure, there was Norway and Denmark who kind of controlled them for long periods of time in, in a way, but they weren't a colony like Newfoundland and Labrador where the fish was meant for export. And the only way you survived was that you had a few cattle and chickens and some root crops and so on. But that wasn't the industry. You know, that's not, that's just to keep you alive. And so they've, um, they've had the advantage, I suppose, of realizing that nobody else will feed them and they're going to be there. And so that's why there's such a, a, such a pride in Icelandic goods because, uh, well, they just have realize that's their history. They have a lot of different kinds of produce, but all small quantities, high transport costs. The size of Iceland is almost the very same as the size of the island of Newfoundland. Iceland is 103,000 square kilometers and Newfoundland Labor is 108 square kilometers, the, the island. So it's very, very close. It's also populated sort of around the outside. Uh, in coastal communities, the, ins the inside, the interior has very few roads, uh, lots of mountain roads and uh, a few, uh, few glaciers and so on. Support services are scattered in small units across the geography. So there's small communities that, uh, that exist. And, um, but the relationship between uh, like in municipal government, about a third of your income tax goes to the municipality, not just to the federal or provincial government. So municipalities get some funding to provide services for their communities, which includes services around quality of life, whether it be daycare, uh, uh, hot pots like ba baths, you know, spas and so on. But the, 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 the sense of the value of living in some of these communities is higher because there's quite a bit of investment in those communities and that was part of the part of the logic. The other interesting thing I found is that while councillors are elected, mayors are often a, hired or appointed, you know, you, you, you can become the mayor of St. John so you'd apply for the job and the elected councillors would, would hire you but your job is to be the mayor for everybody. You have no political connection. So you aren't stuck with the political cycle as the mayor. So it's a kind of an interesting different model that they've, uh, they scratch their head at us, we scratch our head at them. Um, few retail or wholesale companies dominate the retail market. So it's sort of like here, we have just a handful of grocery chains, they do as well. The difference is that some of them are uh, organized by farmers or farmers co-ops. Um, farmers are very independent individuals who sometimes uh, have a difficulty working together because their turnips are better than the turnips in the next field and they don't want them to go into the same cold storage and be sold at the same price and so on. These are all, I grew up with all of this because my father and his brothers argued constantly about small things like that. Um, but in the end, sometimes government makes policies that incentivizes cooperation. Says if you work together, we're gonna get some benefit from that and people do decide to then cooperate. And I think that's something that while they grumble about the co-ops, I say, well, you've, at least you've got a co-op, at least you've got a slaughterhouse in your community. You've got an abattoir in your region. We don't, we don't. So, um, those of you who are in Iceland, what do, you, what do you think of the food? Did you enjoy the food? How was it? It's good, yeah, it's, it's very good, it's very good, it's excellent food. These are examples of meals that are purchased at uh, small places, uh, small communities like the size of Clarenville, something like that. So some of their restaurants are very good. On the right is the very famous lamb soup. 
uh, or sheep meat soup. They tend to refer to it as sheep meat as opposed to lamb. Uh, we, we say lamb no matter how old the animal is, just because you can't sell it otherwise. Although some chefs say that uh, mutton has a better taste, it's a stronger taste, uh, it's a more vibrant taste. Uh, here it's your hard price uh, you know, to, to sell that. The food, they have some uh, very typical foods. They eat a lot of dairy products, and so they have a, a wide dairy industry. The very big difference is they do secondary production of dairy products. So they have 80-some kinds of cheese. They have skier, which we now have in some of our grocery stores, which is an Icelandic yogurt. They have misa, which is a, a drink made out of whey. Whey is a byproduct of the cheese-making process. They have a whole bunch of things, much of which I don't know what it is, actually, but it's an Icelandic, but you, you try it out anyways. Um, uh, kefirs, things that you know, are sort of coming on here. But the feeling was, uh, butter, of course, that all of that has to be made locally because that way you use your milk, because people aren't drinking milk the way they used to. And so that's something that really impresses me about that place that we could do. We ship off 30,000 some liters per day off the island of industrial milk because we don't have any cheese processing here except for two small cheese makers. We, we do no butter, we do no ice cream. somewhere else and we ship it back. So um, when we have brought Icelanders over for conferences and so on and they look at that and they say, how many people? It was 520,000. How many cheesemakers? And at that point there was just one. Uh, we, have, we have the one, you know. Um, and they just sort of look at us and they can't imagine a, a, a group of people who feel that they're trying to be self-sufficient, who has allowed this to happen. Um, so anyway, that's... Um, it's a, fair, it's a fair comment on their part. This is a couple things. I think there's horses on the right. I know they love them, they worship them and so on, but they're very practical people. Uh, I, I've kind of called them on at once, you know, being the North American that I am. Well, wait a minute, you really value these things, but you're eating them. What's, what's going on here? That, that to me seems like a contradiction. And they said, well, you know, we love our horses, yeah, but if they're about to die or we don't have space for them, we'll eat them. We're not going to bury them. You know, why would you bury perfectly good protein and uh and actually it is perfectly good protein although people are eating less and less meat uh they did have a whale uh, this year's the first year in 20 or so that they haven't done any whale hunting uh people don't eat whale very much at all in the, an icelander's lifetime they may eat whale a couple times or whatever it wasn't a big thing uh but they kept doing it now they realize they make more money off whale by the whale watching than by actually um uh, using them for meat, so it's, uh, it's, it's much less. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing, like we used to do salting of meat, traditionally they would do what they call souring or whatever, and so they'd put it in whey and, uh, and they, would, they, would, they would sour, and it would, uh, I don't know if you could imagine, you know, like spoiled dairy products along with rotting cabbages, you know, just the, 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 the beauty of that kind of a smell. And for traditional Icelanders, sometimes those, those bring back memories. I had a friend who grew up um, uh, uh, when the Maasai in, in Africa where they would have uh, uh, blood and milk and curdle together and so on. And every time he feels uh, homesick for home, he takes out his gourd and he takes a deep whiff of the blood and the curdled milk. And he said, that reminds me of home. So if you're an Icelander, you would, you would get, uh, you know, some of that, uh, uh, that, that, that soured food. For a Newfoundland and Labradorian, I don't know what you'd smell, like summer savory? But, you know, it's, uh, but they're probably uh, uh, beef or something like that, um, a salt meat. So they, um, they have that. They, they, they do like their meats, which I'll show you in just, in just a minute. They also have a lot of dried fish as well. So in the gas station or the grocery store, you see this little dried fish. Uh, I might have a picture of it here, actually. Yeah, bit of fiskur, and uh, and you chew on that. It's like chewing on sort of like a dried cod and so on, and it has a magical effect on your breath, um, <laughs> which uh, allows you to work con alone constantly. You know, which really it gets rid of. You know, if you have bothersome colleagues in your office, you know, just have a bit of that as they're talking to you, and you'll see them melt away. Uh, this is. Uh, 
You can't quite see that very well, but that's hakarl. That's a famous rotted shark, which uh, only tourists eat. Um, so, of course, I ate it once because I figured I had to. Uh, it has an ammonia kind of taste. It's buried in the ground for a period of time. It's not particularly good. It has a gelatinous texture, sort of like, like cod tongues that haven't been cooked very well. This one here you get in, it's called svid, and it's, um, you can kind of see it's a sheep's head. You can see there are teeth there and the snout right at the bottom here. There. And uh, a bit of the ears. You can buy that in the grocery store. That's like a, out of Sobeys, you buy it. It's smoked sheep's head, and it's good for lunches. Um, so, but it's very straightforward, you know, and uh, uh, it, it is a, a delicacy. They also have uh, various kinds of beers, which they started making about 1987. Until then, beer was illegal officially, um, but they'd had a lot of other kinds of alcohols. But people had obviously been making it because immediately out of the gate, they had all kinds of really good beers. So it makes you wonder, have you people been doing something? Um, this is an example of consumption of dairy products that you can see the, the sale of milk uh, has been going down. That's liquid milk. But yogurts have gone up, especially cheeses at the bottom, went in that time period from 2.5 million um, kilograms to almost 5 million. So almost doubled in that period of time. So that's why the dairy farmers are so keen to continue to, um, uh, to do secondary production. They eat a lot of meat, but it's changed. So back in 1983, the average person ate 45 kilos of lamb or sheep meat every year, which is a fair bit when you think about it. Uh, now they eat, uh, well, in 2015, the last year I get a figure for, is a little under 20 kilos. So that's a major change. The things that they're eating more of would be, and they're eating less horse too, more beef, but pork and poultry. So pork has gone up fourfold. Can you guess why they're eating more pork? Why more pork is consumed, I should say, in Iceland? It's tourists. They want their bacon in the morning. And so people in Iceland have also got a bit of a taste for it. But pork has really dramatically increased. It's a real challenge because there's only 10 pig farmers in Iceland. We have one. We, we <laughs> Uh, well, there's a few who have pigs here and there. I visited one of them. He has, I said, you know, you've got the second largest pig farm in Newfoundland and Labrador. He said, yeah, I guess I do. He had six pigs at the time. <laughs> um, so, so they have 10 pig farms. They have about 3,500 sows altogether. They each have on average 21, 22 per year. Anyway, you, they, they have almost enough pork to feed their demand, but they're under immense pressure to bring pork in from other parts of Europe but they don't want fresh pork brought in because they want a price differential between fresh pork and frozen pork, but they've been under increasing pressure in this past year. They've had to fold to that pressure and they are starting to allow fresh pork in from Spain and Portugal and so on. And the one pig farmer that I saw told me, you know, I use 1 60th of the antibiotics and so on on my herd. I use 1 60th of the people in Spain that we're getting it from, and I have to compete with them. And, well, he was a bit cheesed off. Anyway, uh, poultry as well is a real challenge, because poultry is a, uh, when tourists travel, they like to travel with their own tastes intact, and so they want pig meat and poultry meat, you know? And so they've ended up uh, having to increase the, uh, the, the poultry as well, and I think later I have a slide, but they've been almost able to meet that demand. But the challenge is, they realize consumer tastes change, so we have to figure out how to change along, along with that. Oh yeah, there it is. Just to, not that you want to know all of this stuff, but let's say dairy cattle, they had 26,742 uh, dairy cattle. Um, the average, that's on about 630 dairy farms. The average dairy farm in Iceland has 42 cattle, something like that. What's the average dairy farm in Newfoundland and Labrador have? What would you guess? Anyone? Up, higher, 180. We have the highest average size of dairy farm in all of Canada. Uh, the rest of Canada, it's more like uh, 80, 90, something like that. But we have some very, very large dairy farms, which then ups our, our total. But they would say, the Farmers Association says, if you have about 46, 48 dairy cattle, that's enough to make a living in Iceland. They have quota system as well. It's a more complicated quota system than ours. It includes, if you actually follow certain uh, regenerative agricultural practices, you get more for your milk. Uh, depending on your genetics, you get more for your milk. So it's not just the amount of milk, but it's also how you're farming 
which then affects the, the amount of money that you, that you bring in. You can see sheep they have, and these are winter fed sheep, uh, 458,000. So um, they had too many sheep for a while, they realized that. And so they've cut back, which was hard because sheep was a traditional uh, mainstay of Icelandic food. And speaking of sheep, there they are. Uh, what happens is in June, uh, this is the Icelandic sheep. It's, uh, it's been protected for many years. You're not allowed to bring in other sheep. You can bring in genetic sometimes. I don't know if anybody knows breeds of sheep, but my dad loved Oxfords, but he was, he was I told him this and he, he, he didn't believe me, but it brought scrapey. And you can possibly start another flock from somewhere else that is scrapey free. If you've seen the Icelandic movie Rams, that's all about scrapey. So they are nervous about that, but what happens is there's a lot of genetic diversity within the Icelandic sheep, within that breed. They come in all kinds of colors and so on. And in about early June, they take them out into the, uh, the hills and they're sent out there. They've been bred at that point, so they're all together. Every farmer is, is together and they have a different ear tag. And there's hundreds and thousands of different ear tags. And there's a book that you can get, which makes no sense to me, but I was shown it, that then explains who owns these different ear tags, but they know it. And the people locally, I uh, talked to one guy, he said he was very proud. He knows 200 and some different tags at, by sight and he knows whose farmer, who, 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 where those sheep go. So they are all together in the mountains up until about um, September, maybe early October, but that's kind of pushing them, and the snow has already started in the high mountains, and it sort of pushes them down. So they have a big roundup, and they put them all in pens, and then they figure out who's our who's, and then they take them home. So effectively, for several months of the year, they're eating for free, and they're eating sedges, and they're eating all kinds of other uh, products. And so they consider it a special Icelandic lamb because of that diet, especially in the summer, that tastes especially good. This would be an example of, this is right after they brought, on the left-hand side, after they brought the sheep in. And uh, so they're outside, this would have been in October. So they're down from the mountains, but they won't go into the barn until, um, until a bit later. And some of those won't go into the barn at all. They'll go elsewhere to their destiny, yeah. Um, there are sheep all over the roads, and um, you know, when I first came to Newfoundland, in, well, when I first came in the 80s, uh, there were sheep on the roads in the Northern Peninsula, and I don't know if you remember, in fact, I know the farmer who had them, because I complained to him once, said they're, they're dangerous. But anyway, uh, in Iceland, when you hit a sheep, you have to pay the farmer for the sheep. And by some sort of ma magical situation, the sheep you hit is always the most uh, valuable sheep. <laughs> in the whole flock. No, not that one. Oh, well, it will be this many thousands of kroners. Um, they've started to really push their own lamb, even though it seems funny to be, uh, to be pushing lamb in, in Iceland. But this is their, their roaming free since 874, which is when Iceland was first settled, give or take three years. Uh, they did this through, um, partly through a gas station. They have a gas station chain called N1. And so they have a nice restaurant in them. And so they offered money to the gas station in order to have uh, a lamb soup there. And it's a really good lamb soup. It costs 20 bucks Canadian, so it's not cheap, but it's very good. And they found that their lamb increased. So if you want to get a product out, they go through the restaurants and start uh, doing that. Dairy, as I said, they have uh, uh, somewhat similar to here in terms of having a, a quota system, but they have much smaller dairy farms. They keep losing losing farms, uh, like, just like sheep farms as well, uh, but the loss is not as significant as what we've had even in this province. Uh, as I said, there it showed that they had 26,000 dairy cattle in Iceland. We have uh, just over 5,000 dairy cattle in Newfoundland and Labrador, but they're high yielding, they're the Holstein Friesens. Their cow is the Icelandic cow and it doesn't give as much, but it doesn't need the, the fancy feed. Oh, I just love the signs there, I like these little, you know, they, they realize that when you're building a bridge, sometimes you just build it one lane instead of two lanes. It's a lot cheaper, half as much, you know, theoretically. So you'll see this sign, and then this is the bridge that you drive over. So you have to make sure that there's nobody else coming. Uh, you know, blind head. There aren't any shoulders. They don't believe in shoulders, really. 
Uh, and this doesn't mean that churches are illegal. It means you're leaving the town. Um, and of course, there's sheep, sheep everywhere. These I love because when you're heading on to a mountain pass, they usually tell you the temperature, the wind speed, the wind direction at the top of the pass, so you know whether to actually go or not. And sometimes it's wise not to go. This Macuary, what they did one year is they made their red lights into hearts and it was so t tender and enjoyable that they've just continued to do that. They have lots of tunnels and little gongs and that's inside a tunnel. There'll always be signs. Okay, if you need to run somewhere, it's 4.6 kilometers that way and then you'll get, uh, yeah, this is very helpful. Every farm has a sign. Every farm has a name. And so you'll see, we in Newfoundland Labrador farms are invisible uh, almost. But here, you, you drive around and you see all these signs, and you realize that's a farm, that's a farm, that's a farm. And uh, there are about 5,000 some farms. I think I'm getting close to the end, but I'll just show you a couple pictures, and then we can talk about some of those others. Uh, Agritourism is a huge thing in uh, Iceland. They've realized that they, they, that's a way to extract money. We have a handful of agritourism operators in our province. This is Fritaimar, which they used to be a horse farm that did tomatoes on the side. And people always wanted to look in the, the, in the greenhouses. So you go in, they're open 365 days a year from uh, 11 to 4, and they're booked, booked every, every meal. Uh, and so you eat uh, tomato soup, which is the tomatoes they can't sell in the store because they have little blemishes or something. And so they use them as they do secondary production there up at the top uh, there's basil on the table so you just take a bit of basil and put it in your soup and it's a wonderful place uh, place to eat there's their they do about a ton of tomatoes a, a week out of there to to Reykjavik this is an example of a dairy farm a Stidlir, and it's uh, this picture is taken from an ice cream uh, that's the ice cream parlor and you can see the stable right through and so that's the idea about showing people uh, what you're doing on the farms. That's from the restaurant. You look down and there's lots of information about the heritage of the farm. It's a great tourism uh, location. This is another one like that. And you can eat your dinner while you watch them milk the cattle. Uh, and they'll let you taste the raw milk as well, which is illegal, but it's Iceland. Um, so that's an example there. Uh, Bruna Lau, this is an ex example of uh, the, the sort of greenhouses, and I like how she uses old uh, carriages there to take the peppers around because it makes a lot of sense. And when they see that little sign, Islensk Paprika, they'll buy it, she said. She has no problem selling her, uh, her uh, peppers, uh, her paprikas. That's the, that's the greenhouse there uh, in the early evening. So it's a, and there's the pig farmer guy. He also has a guest house in the back. And the guest house is 37 meters from his pig barn. And he has no complaints. And he's the one who wants to build a cafe inside his new barn uh, so that people can eat and also uh, watch the pigs. Anyway, this is just saying that uh, they do a lot of, uh, of innovative things there. About 15% of the farms are involved in either tourism or some side of innovative sort of uh, uh, secondary production. So most of these I've said, you know, our length of agricultural tradition is different. Hunting and gathering are common. We both use tourism or food in tourism. Um, they have specific drinks. They don't screech anybody in, but they, they could. With Hat Carl and Brennan, they could easily do that. But there are a lot of ways in which we differ and uh, we could learn from them. The one difference is that they are a country, so they can create their own rules, whereas we're part of a country. And so it's very hard for us to create rules around not allowing butter in from Nova Scotia because we are one country. And so it's even hard for us to create manufactured right here rules, although every other province does it. Like they all are trying to promote their own agriculture. We just haven't really done it very much. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. I don't know what to be more fancy pictures, but, uh, but to take some questions because I've been talking long enough long enough and you haven't been saying anything you've been very polite I've got a mic here I'll pass around so people online can hear I also have a few questions in my back pocket that I'm dying <laughs> to ask so if there's any lull but I got I'll a feeling the, uh, with this crowd there won't be a lull here you go just introduce yourself hi I'm Chris Palmer just want to make a quick comment on your the idea of, of eating uh, puffins and reindeer Sometimes, if you're very lucky and you're flying 
Iceland Air, particularly between European destinations. Out of your own flight mail. <laughs> and one of my favorite bumper stickers was produced in the 1980s here by the Sheep Producers Association of Newfoundland. And it read, Eat local lamb, 20,000 roaming dogs can't be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I want to very quickly ask you about your priorities in terms of possible areas of cooperation between Newfoundland agricultural mm -hmm. food processors and, um, and Iceland. Mm -hmm. In terms of developing opportunities, uh, back in 2007 when there were flights out of Gander yeah. to Europe, Blueberries are very much sought of. We talked to the Farmers Union and several companies and agricultural interests who are most interested in our low bush blueberries. Um, and uh, you, your figures show that they're dessert eaters. But I wonder of all the things that's, that you've shown in your list, where might the priorities be mm. for good collaboration or for sales from Newfoundland yeah, to Iceland? Yeah. That's, that's a very good uh, question, and it's the sort of question I should have an answer to. Um, I think there are several, I mean, one, one of the things I talked about secondary production, I don't want to harp on that, but I think that is a major piece, is that we do have raw materials that we're not using, that includes vegetable uh, products as well that we're not doing the secondary production in. Uh, and so that, though, requires a level of entrepreneurship. I mean, again, they've got hundreds of years on us. So, but I think that's something we could do. The, the work, and I know there are, you know, the two cheesemakers that we have are thinking about the byproduct, the way, how to, how to use that. So I think to, to get some advice from them on how to get started in some of those industries would be good. The, uh, one of the other things would be uh, the agritourism piece, is that they've been very successful at that, and a number of farmers realize that's a part of what they do. We don't have as many tourists. We have maybe half a million a year, or whatever. They have 2.2 million. They're kind of slacking off because they realize that's too many. But, uh, but it means that it was the Farmers Association that started the homestay program and so people could go and stay on a farm and uh, usually it's you know 150 to 200 dollars a night because like you know lodging is pretty expensive in Iceland and they're not you know pristine wonderful lodgings either but the, but we haven't really got that connection we have lots of retired people who have B and B's but they just need to set them up on farms and so on to, to pull pull that together I think the other thing that they've got is um, their Farmers Association is pretty active, and at one time, every farmer had to belong to the Farmers Association, a bit like the Federation of Agriculture here. That changed three years ago, maybe four years ago, and the challenge that they had was how many of those farmers will continue to be members of that association. And right now, they have about 80% or so. So we've got five to 6,000 people who define themselves as farmers there, 80% of which are part of the Farmers Association. And so there's a much stronger lobby group uh, when they lobby for different regulations around food or when they're dealing with some of the uh, grocery store chains, they have had a stronger uh, presence. Trouble is the EU rules sort of take precedence over that sometimes when the, they as a country want to keep out certain products. Uh, but they fool with that. They're also very innovative. So Matisse, which you hear about a lot related to the fishery, was an organization that was set up. It's kind of like what maybe at one point Innovation NL or TCII or whatever they're called now could have done if they had really focused on innovation. So they also do agricultural innovation. So they don't just work with fisheries. So if you visit their labs, they're working on all kinds of secondary production of byproducts from the vegetable industry and so on, and how to create something. They're working on 3D food, stuff that might not sound appetizing, but um, there's that, that sense that they need to continue to work, for, work toward, and they can't just rely on their traditional vegetables. That's what comes to mind right now, but there's probably some, as I drive away, I'll say, darn, Th those weren't the big ones. Yeah. One other question here. I think you had a question, right? Yeah, okay. I think you, you actually touched on this just now, but I, I'll give you a chance to expand on it, because I was curious about kind of the politics and policy side of this. Like, yeah. what, what do the politics of, of agriculture and, and production look like in Iceland? How is it different from that there is a more sort of 
powerful or, or strengthen farmers organization. But is there anything else you'd highlight in terms of differences in the in how the political yeah. conversation yeah. happens? Yeah. The Farmers Association is also, uh, it, it owns one of the nicest hotels in Reykjavik, and that's a revenue stream, which has the best breakfast in all of Iceland. Uh, so so it's, it's not just that they're sort of large, but they've, they have a long tradition, and they're, and they're well-funded, and they've worked on, on funding themselves as well. Uh, I think also the history of co-ops uh, is an advantage. So when they didn't have, we have a problem because we don't have abattoirs in many parts of the province. Uh, we have no federal meat inspection anywhere in the province. So that means you can't really sell to the Sobeys and the Dominions of the world because they want to be able to have the meat cross provincial boundaries. And so what happened there is that they set up a uh, farmers association to help to set up co-ops. And these would be groups of farmers who have pigs or cattle or whatever, and they'd start an abattoir. Some of those are becoming more distanced from the farmers, and that's the criticism I hear from farmers. They say, well, it's not farmers anymore, it's a bunch of bureaucrats and butchers or whatever. But that's just, the, that's just the evolution of those organizations. But I think they understood the value. So Accurary was a town of many, many co-ops at one time. Uh, hotel Kia, which is the big hotel there, Kia was the cooperative in that area, and they made clothes and they did all kinds of things. So that tradition uh, is, is it's a bit different than the traditions that we have that we have here. Um, but I think a part of it too is just that the the uh, the stubbornness, the, the value that they place on supporting Icelandic activities and so on is, is important. And the political system is different too. So whenever somebody is in parliament, for example, this one sheep farmer that I visited, he had to go to Reykjavik because he was an alternate to the member of parliament from his region. If that person who was a member of parliament can't be in the, in the house or the, the, the well, I forget the name that they, uh, yes. Uh, on that day, somebody else who is an alternative, who's been selected as an alternative, has to be there. So every, every region is represented. But it's represented much more broadly because some of the alternates might be slightly different in their political views as the, the member from, uh, from the region. And so it just seems much, uh, much more porous. And of course, they have a number of different parties, including the Pirate Party, which I love. You know, uh, and so they kind of work together. So the ability to work together, I think, is something that they have that we don't. We're, we're in a bit of a problem in many parts of Canada too, and the United States, need I say, where people cannot work together anymore and policy is always just to the four-year cycle. And it's just, I don't know how we get out of that other than just joining uh, one of these Nordic countries and say, you know, remake us. <laughs> we went wrong somewhere. And the other thing up front, sorry. Go I mean, ahead. sometimes, sometimes the thing is, it's nice to have a flat structure. And I know it, in Newfoundland Labrador, we have a very flat structure. And at one time, I thought it was kind of charming that if I had a problem, I'd go directly to my MHA or the minister, because the minister will talk and then talk to him. And now I, I just don't find that attractive at all. <laughs> I just wish there were people I could go to, whether it be an agriculture or fisheries or whatever, who were experts in that area who were, you know, at the bureaucratic level or whatever, who would make decisions. And I keep, keep my MHA out of it, because I think that's caused a lot of problems for us. But that's my opinion, yeah. Question up here. Hi, I'm Chris Brooks, and I got a comment and a question. My comment yep. is that I was I'm delighted by the idea of all the sheep, everybody's sheep, all in this yeah. gigantic pasture, yes. and they sorted out at the end of the yeah. summer with the ear ties. Because when I was in, in Reykjavik, uh, I was really struck with people to interview, <laughs> and I mean, it's impossible. I mean, if you, yeah. if I'm trying to find Ivan Emke, well, maybe his son will know where he is on Sunday, yeah. and so, but I can't look up uh, Emke. Your son would be Ivanson, yeah, and then yeah. and then his son, uh, if he was John Ivanson, his son would be Johnson. Yeah. So it's absolutely impossible to track people. <laughs> so I can imagine, you know, hordes of Icelanders wandering around the sheep field trying to figure right. out who sheep is. <laughs> But um, my question is, I was really struck by the, the number and quantity of wild birds that, that yeah. they shoot. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering what the difference is. I mean, you know, like here, uh, on the other side of the hill here, I'm infested with, with black back and herring gulls. And I notice, my God, they, they eat yeah. them. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we're not allowed to, sh to shoot them. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering, do you have any thoughts about the difference between yeah. wildlife regulations there and here? Yeah. There it was, 
that was a part of uh, self provisioning is that you needed to use whatever was available, whatever was on the land and whatever. The, so the seabirds were part, were considered to be a part of what people, they had a right to. And since they had enough seabirds and not a big population, and hunting just for the hunting's sake is not really particularly popular there at all. Like it, um, so th they didn't over, and I don't know if we ever, uh, in terms of seabirds, had too many as well, but I think that's just maintained itself and that people, when I talk to people, for example, about favorite meals or whatever, and they might say at Christmas, you have to have ptarmigan or you have to have something. So seabirds are a part of uh, sort of joyous celebrations in their, in their cycle, in their life. And so I don't know if, if there are people here maybe where you know family members who a uh, particular time of year, Easter or whatever, eat seabirds. Sometimes they eat seabirds just in the season or whatever. But I think it was more connected into the culture maybe. And so it's maintained itself and it's popular. It's a way to get out. They love to get out, uh, out into the, wa the wilderness and walk around. Uh, they dress well, they're good at safety and everything else. Um, the, the, the safety uh, search and rescue folks are supported by a couple things, including the sale of fireworks. Sale of fireworks is illegal, except through the, the, uh, the, fire, the safety people. And so at, at uh, New Year's, there's amazing amounts of fireworks and, and a lot of drinking, which is two things that generally don't go together or you'd think safety wouldn't be. But, but they, they, they have such a high value on, on people who are out there able to protect everybody else. They, they say, here's this one time, we're going to give them one revenue stream and it's going to be fireworks. I, I don't know how I got there from here, but, but it's that they love to get, they love to go out into the, to the wilderness and seabirds is, is one of the things that does it. The other thing about the sheep is that um, if you have sheep, you, you are told which pastures you go to to bring them down. It would include your own, plus you might go to one other. So you're always, there's this dense network of sheep farmers who know each other because every year they herd sheep together or they'll herd it somewhere else. Or so your sheep might end up in some other pasture, some other area because it's chased by somebody's dog or whatever. And so then they'll call you up and you'll go over there. So the relationship between the farmers is very connected compared to our situation where farmers see each other at meetings and they consider each other as being competitors. And so that's a big thing with sheep farming is I think there is a culture around sheep farming that people all realize they have to look after each other. A couple of years back, there was an early snow, thousands of sheep died because they, they perished. Everybody got out there with whatever equipment they could to try to, uh, uh, try to save whatever sheep they could. And that's because they have a really strong culture of cooperation. And I think the way in which they farm sheep means that that supports that. And we don't have that same kind of support. We don't have auction barns like in some provinces of the, of the country where farmers get together every Tuesday or every Monday, they eat pie and talk to each other and watch the prices and they develop a relationship. We don't have that. There are also lots of sheep in Reykjavik. There's a Reykjavik Sheep Owners Society. There used to be thousands of sheep in the city limits. Don't think about chickens, they have sheep. They have horses in the city limits too as well and they've survived. Any other questions? I think the title of Ivan's next presentation should be, I don't know how I got here from here. Yeah, really, <laughs> it's my life, eh? that's right. Uh, or a book, I'm just going to check my notes because I had another question, I think, that didn't quite get answered. Okay, so aside potentially, one minute each. Um, opportunities that you think Newfoundland could learn from Iceland. What are, the, what are some of the missed opportunities that we can just say, you know what, that really works here and we have the, the, you know, the cultural and the setup, we just haven't thought of it yet. What are some of those ideas yeah. that you yeah. can see? At one time I would have said they have, uh, you know, close to half of the farmers have post-secondary. That's something that we're kind of missing. Uh, not because uh, universities or colleges are particularly good at teaching technical 
skills. They do some of that sometimes. But what that did is it created an atmosphere around farming as an occupation that sort of professionalized it in a way. Uh, people also got to know many other people who were then dairy farmers as well. So I meet young people at the Agricultural University of Iceland. They're going into dairy farms. They're, they say, I'm meeting here the people who I will work with the rest of my life in terms of other dairy farmers. And when I talk to the, the people in Newfoundland and Labrador who went to Truro or whatever, or gone to other places, they say that's one of the real advantages to getting out and meeting some people from somewhere else is it broadens your view of what's possible. You know, I would have been bigger on that. I'm still big on that. I still think that we need ways for our farmers and people interested in farming to interact with a wider variety of individuals. It's happening in smaller communities, like in this region where you've got a lot of small producers who are kind of meeting each other or seeing each other at the farmer's market or whatever, getting to know each other and so on and understanding that, that they all have to work together and not just simply compete with each other. And I think that, that's the thing that we need elsewhere in, uh, on the island as well. So I, I, I like that. I also um, I like the fact that they, the producers themselves sometimes really went to the retailers or in the restaurants and pushed products. I don't know if we've done that to the same extent here. Um, so I talked about the lamb soup. So they go to the, the I mean, we don't really have her now that the big stops have sort of disappeared, but they go and they say, we're gonna subsidize this for you. And we've got like, these chefs who've worked on a lamb soup and, and by gosh, people are gonna sort of buy that, you know? And so they trust it. And I'm not sure if we've got a good example of that. 20 years ago, they started selling turnip chips at the big stop. I don't know if you ever, ever remember turnip chips, root vegetable chips and so on. And I thought that was the greatest thing. And it kind of, well, it was a, it was a test and it, it disappeared. We need to find ways to use those root crop vegetables uh, that, we, that we grow. The other thing that Icelanders would scratch their heads at is they, they say, okay, you eat a lot of French fries here, don't you? Yeah, uh, frozen French fries. Well, that's a big market for your farmers, right? No. Our frozen French fries are come from away fries. They come from somewhere else, they're processed somewhere else. A couple of companies have started and they tried to do it and it hasn't really worked out in the long term. But I, but, but I like the fact that they are, they are, they're amazed at some of the things that we do. They're amazed that we eat so many French fries, none of which, almost none of which come from our own soil. We can't ship our potatoes anywhere else because of potato blight or whatever, but we ship a lot of other stuff in. And so that's the kind of attitude that they would have about the world that I would like to see a little bit more here. Like, why, why do I accept your things when you're not gonna accept mine? Why do I accept your regulations when you don't accept my regulations? Um, and, but that's a huge cultural shift. But it's, you know, the young people will do it, right? Sure, no pressure at all. No pressure, yeah. Um, oh, just one, oh. one second. I'll grab the mic for you. We don't want to let the people online <laughs> miss out. Oh, hello to people online. I don't know where the camera is, actually. It's, very, but it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. What would be your comments in terms of difference between the two, in terms of marketing? There was a letter to the editor the other day that more or less said, to be a farmer, you've got to be good at marketing. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, and there are marketing organizations in Iceland that do a lot of that marketing yeah. for their farmers. Yeah, I think, um, I, think I, saw, I saw that letter and one of the comments is sometimes farmers feel like they, 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 they can't be marketers plus producers and all those sorts of things. But I think there are some marketing associations in Iceland where they, they hire professionals, like what we've done with tourism. Like in agriculture, if we, if we would do the same thing as in tourism, it would be very different. In tourism, you didn't say, let's every bed and breakfast owner do their own marketing, okay? And you then compete with everybody else, try to get on Facebook and whatever, you know, uh, social media. That's, the, that's what we've done in agriculture, almost. We, the, the producer associations are very small, except for the uh, supply managed commodities. Uh, and so they haven't been able to do concerted marketing efforts. The sheep producers are, are really working and they're kind of developing and so on. Beef producers are as well. But we haven't used the same professional attitude toward marketing in food as we have with tourism. Uh, so, or you could say with the fishery either because you got big companies who did their own marketing and they didn't necessarily want to, uh, you know, they have their own, their own, their own markets. I think that's it for our time. I want to Wait. thank Ivan, and I suspect
you back again next okay. time you're <laughs> next time you're around. Uh, for anyone who's interested in watching the session again or sharing it with someone who wasn't able to make it or uh, or something along those lines, we will have a, the recording of today's session up on the Harris Center website, um, and it'll also be included in the next regional newsletter. Uh, which is the Harris Center's newsletter. It comes out monthly-ish, and that's my shameless plug. Uh, if you don't get it already, you can uh, sign up for it on the Harris Center's website. I promise I won't spam you too much, uh, and it's all in, in this last edition, and there's... But it was amazing, and so we <laughs> thought, okay, well, if we can't put it all <laughs> turn up company, right. which we touched on a little bit. Yes, yes. Anyway, thank you very much, and thanks for coming out. Yep, thank you. Oh, that's good. Yeah, hopefully people will find some value to it. Thank you. you can. Yep.